I'm an ex-Navy SEAL. Here's why I retired. I was a Navy SEAL. BUD slash S class 237 and assigned to SEAL Team 10. I enlisted in the Navy after dropping out of college. I realized it just wasn't for me. Going to college, getting my degree, and working some 9-5 job for the rest of my life. I felt like I was meant for something. More. My parents weren't happy when I told them I had quit college and planned on becoming a Navy SEAL. Looking back on it, I probably should have pushed through my last two years of college so I could have at least had a degree to fall back on, in case things didn't work out. I made it through training, and let me tell you, that was one of the hardest things I have ever had to do, and eventually earned my SEAL Trident. I remember the day like it was yesterday. Seaman Dakota Waters, please step forward, said my SQT instructor. He smiled, pinned on my trident, and we saluted each other. And that was that. I was officially a Navy SEAL. Everyone clapped, including my parents who were there, and had grown to accept my decision. The moment was surreal. So much hard work, finally paying off. Within a month, I was shipped out to Afghanistan for my first tour. After my first tour, I found a girlfriend, Mary, who I eventually married. During my second tour, I was notified we had a little girl on the way. After three tours to all around the Middle East, I had eventually worked my way up to Chief Petty Officer. The guys on my squad, they were my brothers. I had spent more time with them than I did my own family, and we had been through hell together. One day about four months after coming home from Iraq after our third tour... Me and some buddies from the team were kicking back by a bonfire at a ranch one of my buddies owned. We were having a good time, drinking beers, telling stories, laughing, and reminiscing. It was at that moment when I received a phone call. It was our commanding officer. I thought this was odd because our commanding officer, L.T. Shipley, never calls us unless it's extremely urgent. I told everyone to quiet down, and I put it on speaker. Chief Petty Officer Waters, are you alone? said Shipley on the other end of the line. Um, no, I'm with the squad. Why? I replied. Good, they need to hear this too, he replied. In one week, you and your squad will be shipping out to Panama to conduct reconnaissance on illegal trade routes leading up through Central America and into the United States. We all looked at each other somewhat in shock. We had all just gotten back from deployment not four months ago, and now they are shipping us off to Panama. One of my teammates, Daniel, spoke up and said that it can't be right. There are no known drug trafficking routes in southern Central America. They all start in Costa Rica. Maybe they found new ones, and they want us to gather more information on them, my buddy Ricky said, sounding incredulous. Regardless of what exactly they want us to be looking at, it's complete bullshit. We are already getting deployed again, I complained. We all thought the whole situation was very weird, but eventually we just accepted it. Just as stated, exactly a week from that day, we were on a plane being shipped out to Panama. Panama is a trashy place. No offense to anyone from there. But after what happened to me there, I do not regret talking bad about the place. It's awful. The second we landed at the headquarters in the middle of the jungle where we would be living for the next two months, I knew I was going to hate it. Humid, sticky, warm bugs constantly buzzing around your ear. It's enough to make a bunch of hardened warriors go mad. We got to our bunks, unpacked our stuff, and relaxed. We knew it was going to be a long two months, so we needed all of the sleep we can get. Wonder what exactly they're going to have us spying on tomorrow, asked Johnson. Our team's medic. No idea, Ricky replied. That's the last thing I remember before drifting off into sleep. I was awoken the next morning to L.T. Shipley banging on the side of my bunk. Everyone up, time to go. Everyone up, coming. I checked the clock on the wall above my bed, 3, 42 in the morning. I rubbed my eyes, shook my head, and sat up. This damn early L.T., I said irritatingly. I don't make the rules, I just enforce him, he replied. Everybody up, let's go. 
Once everyone was up, we grabbed a quick snack to give us some energy and then headed to the briefing room to figure out what we were going to be doing. The briefing room was small. You could fit maybe ten people at most in there. We were greeted by some army general whose name I didn't know. He shook our hands and sat all four of us, myself, Ricky, Daniel, and Johnson down. All right, boys, your mission is to gather as much information as you can on this tunnel. We discovered about 80 clicks southeast from this point. We suspect it to be used by drug traffickers to smuggle contraband such as heroin and cocaine across the border into Mexico so the cartels can ship it to America. There is a clearing with a perfect view of the entrance to the tunnel, about 600 yards where you all can remain hidden. Overall, the objective is fairly simple. Watch the entrance of the tunnel. Photograph what you see. Make reports and report back of anyone entering or exiting the tunnel. Got it? We all replied with, yes, sir. Xville will be 20 clicks over this mountain at approximately 9 p.m., so don't miss it, Shipley added. It was at that moment I realized that Shipley was in full combat gear. I don't know how I hadn't noticed it before. Are you going on this op with us, Shipley? I asked. Oh, no, I got my own op with another squad, he said. I thought that was a little weird. I thought this entire situation was weird. Ever since we had arrived, things hadn't seemed right. I asked my squad if they felt the same way, and they said they did. Johnson said he had been getting weird looks from all of the higher-ranking personnel since he had gotten here. He told me he even saw two Air Force women pointing at him and whispering something in each other's ears. I didn't know what to make of the situation, but what could I do? My job was to execute what the higher-ups told me to do. We were to load up on the helicopter in five minutes. All right, boy, I said. Let's load up. We collected our gear, weapons, and everything else we would have needed for this operation. The helicopter ride there was rather uneventful. Twenty minutes of flying over a thick jungle, until eventually we saw it. You could barely see it due to it being the early morning and still being dark, but it was there. It was bigger than any tunnel I had ever seen. The opening of it stood at least 90 feet tall and looked like it had been there for centuries. The helicopter flew us right past it, about half a mile away from it, until it dropped us off. The reason we get dropped off so far away from the objective is in case anyone of interest is at the location at that current moment, they will not see us. Once we were dropped off, it was a good walk to get where we were going to settle up in. Once we got there, we unpacked everything we had. Johnson had his pair of binoculars. Ricky had a zoomed-in scope he attached to his long-range rifle. Daniel had a camera and notepad. And I was on communications duty, or comms, as we like to call it. The first five hours were uneventful, sitting there with our perfect view of the entrance to the tunnel. Nothing happened. No one entered. No one left it. It was around 10, 30 at this point, and the sun was up now. It was around this time when I told Ricky, Daniel, and Johnson that we should take sleeping schedules. Two of us keep watch while the other two sleep, and we would switch every three hours. We were to wake the two sleepers up if anything eventful happened. Daniel and Johnson offered to take first watch while Ricky and I slept. I was fine with that idea. The Lord knew I needed some shut-eye. I rolled out my backpack for a pillow and slowly drifted off to sleep. Dakota. Dakota, wake up. I was awoken to Johnson shaking me and yelling in my face. Ho, oh, what's going on? I asked. I then looked around and noticed Daniel was missing. Where the hell did Daniel go? I asked. The tunnel. He walked into the tunnel. What do you mean? He walked into the tunnel, asked Ricky, who was awake at this point. It was about an hour after you two had gone to sleep. He had been completely normal, but then he just got up and started walking towards the entrance. I tried to stop him, but he just kept walking. It was almost as if he was in some kind of trance, Johnson replied. We gotta go after him, I said. We were given strict orders not to enter the tunnel, Johnson replied hesitantly. That's our damn brother in there, 
Let's go, Ricky said, grabbing his rifle and running towards the tunnel. Me and Johnson both grabbed our rifles and followed Ricky. As we got closer and closer to the tunnel, I began to make out more distinct features of it. It had stalagmite and stalactites, and it didn't go straight through the mountain. It went down into it. This wasn't a tunnel. This was a cave. Wait, I said. Look at this. I don't know any drug traffickers that would use this to smuggle cocaine. Ricky and Johnson both looked as baffled as I was. What do we do? asked Ricky. We can't leave Daniel down there, I said. Hope you guys like spelunking. We turned on the flashlights to our rifles and began our descent into the cave. The first few hundred feet had nothing in them, just dark tunnels. But about five hundred feet in, we began noticing drawings on the walls. At first they were just normal caveman drawings, pictures of tigers and leopards from thousands of years ago. But as the drawings went on, they got more confusing. The leopards and tigers were soon replaced by violent scribbles, as if someone had gotten a piece of chalk and scrubbed the walls with it as hard and spastically as they could. We kept following the scribbles along the wall, until they eventually stopped. What was drawn after the scribbles I still have not forgotten to this day. A picture of a person. But it wasn't a person. It had long, disgusting tentacles and dragon-like wings. It had horns on its head with a long, lizard-like tail. But it wasn't so much the drawing of the creature that scared me. It was the drawings of the hundreds of people around it, bowing to it, worshipping it. The pictures then went on to show people giving human sacrifices to this creature. There were drawings of babies being burned alive and the burnt corpse being fed to it. It was disgusting. What the F, said Ricky. Maybe it's a drawing of a deity thought to have been real by an ancient civilization, Johnson replied. It was at that moment we heard Daniel scream from deep within the cave. That's Daniel! I screamed. We all rushed towards where we heard the scream, tripping and tumbling over rocks the entire way. We kept screaming things out, like we're coming, Daniel, or don't worry, buddy. But something in my mind kept telling me it was too late for Daniel, and if we went down there, we would meet his same fate. But I couldn't leave Daniel. Down there, even if he was dead, he's been with me since the first day of SEAL training. He was my brother. We raced down the cave, sprinting as fast as we could until eventually we turned a corner and... Oh my God, Ricky whispered. We all stood there in horror. At first, I didn't exactly know what I was looking at, but then it dawned on me. It was Daniel's body. It was torn to shreds. It was almost unrecognizable, and if it weren't for his dog tag, I might not have been able to figure out it was him. We all stood there over what was left of his corpse, petrified with fear. I was about to say something until we heard a loud crash coming from across the what I now realized was a massive dome-like room within the cave. We all turned to look to where we had heard the crash, and what we saw makes me regret ever joining the military in the first place. That thing, that thing. That was drawn on the walls of the cave. There it was, looking at us. It looked even more hideous in person. It was about forty feet tall, jet black, save for dark blood-colored eyes. It had jagged teeth with ten long, squid-like tentacles protruding from its back. It had those black dragon-like wings and a lizard-like tail, just like on the drawings. Its face. My God, its face. The red eyes and jagged teeth, the rotted skin, and the long black hair. I wanted to say it looked human, but this thing was far from human. It let out one raspy growl, and the walls of the cave began to shake. Then it got even worse. People, thousands of people wearing clothing made out of bones and cloth with face and body paint all over them began closing in on us. I don't know where they came from, but there were at least two thousand of them. We gotta get the hell out of here, I yelled. Ricky and Johnson were still petrified with fear. Let's go, I yelled at both of them. 
All of a sudden, the creature shrieked a disgusting shriek, and one of its tentacles extended a tremendously long length and wrapped around Ricky. With one swift pull, Ricky went flying in the air and into the creature's mouth. I wanted to do something, but there was no time. I yelled at Johnson to follow me, and we both began to run. I fired off a few rounds at the people chasing after us, and they fell to the ground, creating a small gap for me and Johnson to run through. I sprinted through that gap, nearly getting caught by one of the people. Once I was out of the gap, I checked to see if Johnson was behind me, and he was. We both raced up the cave, trying to remember where we had come from. The last thing either of us wanted was to get lost in this hellhole with that thing. We kept sprinting, desperately making our way through the cave until we saw the light from the entrance. I quickly glanced behind me and noticed that some of the people were still chasing after us. I grabbed a frag I had on me and tossed it at them, sending them all flying. The relief only lasted for a second, though, when I heard a demonic screech come from within the cave. At that moment, me and Johnson sprinted out of the cave and kept running. When we were about 300 yards away from the cave, I turned around to see if we were being followed. There it was. Not following us, but standing at the entrance of the cave, looking right at us. We both stared at it for about 30 seconds. It let out one last deafening screech, and then went back into the cave. Neither me or Johnson knew if it was going to come back out, but we weren't staying to find out. We resumed running, not stopping until we knew we were far away from that cave. When we finally stopped, we both found a place to rest, and we just sat there, not saying a word. About an hour passed before Johnson finally asked, What time is it? I checked my mobile clock, 8.30 p.m. Exfil was in 30 minutes it. Do you remember where x was? I asked Johnson. Yeah, when we were running, I somehow managed to keep track of where we were. Luckily for us, the helicopter is supposed to arrive five miles west of here, he replied. I sighed with relief, and we began heading that way. When we got there, the helicopter was waiting for us. What took you all so long? We were just about to head off and leave you. And where are the other two? The pilot asked. I just looked at him with a blank expression on my face. He just nodded and began to take off. When we arrived back at HQ, me and Johnson were pulled into a room and sat down. Four men in suits and the general that had briefed us walked in. They had looks of pity on their faces, and one of the suited men leaned in. He said, Here is $100,000 each for both of you. Never speak of this again. Please, he said. He slid the wads of cash to both of us from across the table, and they all filled out except for the general. The general looked at us with a sad look on his face for a minute, and then informed us that our flight's home would be tomorrow, and the option for an early retirement would be presented to us. I am now a 46-year-old man, still happily married to my loving wife Mary, and the proud father of a beautiful 17-year-old daughter named Jessica. I still keep in touch with Johnson, and sometimes we get together at a bar or around a bonfire and just cry together, cry about what we had witnessed and for the loss of our two brothers. I will forever hold hatred towards the United States military and the government for willingly putting us in the situation they did, lying to us so we wouldn't back out of the operation and getting my two closest friends killed. When my wife asked what happened to Ricky and Daniel, I lie and say they were shot while in Afghanistan. When I wake up screaming at night from the nightmares, I tell her it was just nightmares from what happened in the Middle East. I could never tell her what actually happened or why I was actually diagnosed with severe PTSD. I even lied to the doctors at the Bay, partially because I was informed by the government to never speak of what happened but also because I would be deemed crazy if I ever told anyone. I couldn't keep it to myself any longer, though. I had to get it off my chest. So for all of you out there, never become a Navy SEAL, never enlist in the military, and never, and I mean never, journey to the Darien Gap in Panama. My youngest brother sent me a text one day. 
He'd saved up 700 and wanted a computer. I told him I know a subreddit we can go to, but no. He's found a guy on Craigslist with a machine. Says it's like a 1,000 machine for 600. Want me to go with him to check it out? I can't. Schedule is packed. Guy basically says he can do a Skype call showing the PC working, and I can peek inside the guts from the video call, so I do that. It looks good. Very high-end computer, and everything is brand new with boxes for the components. I tell my little bro, who was 18, that it's all good if he can snatch it, go for it. Well, about 8 p.m., I get a Skype message from the Craigslist seller. I got your brother. I freeze. Blood runs cold, and for a solid 20 seconds, it felt like hours. I started running through how I was going to find this mother and murder him with my bare hands for threatening to hurt my baby brother. Finally, he finishes typing his second message. He wanted to meet in Walmart parking lot. We met up, and I got out to shake his hand, and he just fainted. He's sitting in my SUV. He woke up once and just passed right back out. So I told my bro no, because I had work, but obviously this needed to be handled. So I go out, I get out of my car, and instantly see why my brother basically shit his pants. This dude steps around the SUV and is like nine feet tall, exaggerating, seven foot, and some change, and was so jacked I think he could beat up Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. I'm a little less paranoid than my brother, so I hold my hand out for a shake. We do so, and he puts a giant hand on my shoulder and points inside the side. I can see my little brother sitting in the far back seat with his knees on his chest, like a puppy during a thunderstorm. I chat with the guy. He literally just tried to meet my brother to sell a computer, but he actually fainted in terror. He scooped him up and put him in the back seat to rest. It actually happened. So I open the door and pop my head in. Little bro basically on the verge of tears explain the situation to him. He admits that he thought the Craigslist seller was going to beat him up, steal his 800, and possibly touch his bum inappropriately. I laugh. The seller laughs. I chat with the guy for a bit as my brother is loading the stuff into his car. The guy said he bought computer parts yearly when they went on sale and always sold them for a profit for himself, but at a pretty low cost since he slowly built them over the years was actually a really great guy, said my brother was the first person to ever pass out in fear. I mean, all's well that ends well, and I'm sure it was more scary from my brother's POV, but getting a message from a guy on Skype, I have your brother, is pretty damn scary to be honest. It all began when I was very young. I was playing with my brother in the garden of our house when suddenly I witnessed a scene that seemed out of a different era. The two kids I saw were wearing clothes, unlike anyone our age, and the entire scene was in black and white. At the time, I decided to ignore what had just happened and went back to playing. Some years later, I began to hear from time to time some kind of voices. However, they didn't say anything meaningful. Once it even happened when I was home alone with my brother as we were going up the stairs. I asked him if he heard it, and he replied, What? I understood that he didn't. Nothing significant occurred until junior high. Once, while on the bus home, I saw a very fast-moving, bright white form that resembled a book. Some weeks later, while walking, I saw a bright white humanoid female form holding the same book from before. I saw her countless times afterward. Close to the end of junior high, while in bed but not sleeping, I witnessed a series of flashes. These showed me places and people I didn't know, including a plane resembling those from the early days of aviation, freshly out of the factory. Although the flashes were very fast, one lasted longer. I saw an old man standing in front of a building with marble columns. It felt like I was viewing the scene through a camera, and suddenly he smiled, as if he knew I was there. And then the flashes stopped. I didn't experience anything similar until university. I was studying very far from home in a city we'll call low. Once, while walking in this city, 
I sensed a presence, and a few seconds later, I saw a bright green humanoid form running. It moved so fast that it soon disappeared. After that, I witnessed three more bright humanoid forms. Two black forms and one red form. Nothing more has happened for now. Hey, I law, my girlfriend and I were driving along a forested road in northern Hampshire, United Kingdom, near Blackbush Airport, when I saw something running alongside the car in the woods, or grassy curb staring at me. This happened yesterday at about 5 p.m. after the sun had set. It was a figure that was naked and about four feet tall with yellowish skin, sort of sickly or jaundiced. We were driving at about 50 miles per hour at the time, and the figure was keeping up with the car by running. Regarding identifiable features, the most notable feature was that the figure had large eyes that appeared to have two pupils per eye, one above the other, and it had a large grinning mouth. It vanished quite quickly after I saw it staring at me. Immediately after it disappeared, I started feeling nauseous, and this nausea has lingered into today. My girlfriend did not see it, but has also felt this nausea and unease. I don't believe it could have been my reflection, and I was not tired or otherwise mentally impaired at the time. Does anybody have any ideas or theories on what this thing was? I've posted this before, but a guy I knew from college got a houseboy from Craigslist. Trade rent for sex kind of deal. The houseboy was apparently not too stable, and after getting in a fight over money, managed to strangle the guy I knew to death with a phone cord, stole his car, and was later caught a few states over. I still remember the last time I went hunting with my dad near my grandmother's old house. She had passed away a few years ago, and we inherited her property in the countryside. There was a straight-shot trail that led from her backyard to a cabin in the woods, where we used to spend the night sometimes. It was a cozy place with a fireplace, a kitchen, and a couple of beds. The cabin belonged to some distant relatives of ours who rarely visited it, one of the attractions of the cabin was the pond nearby where we could fish or swim. There was a small pier that had been built recently, and it looked like something out of a horror movie. It was made of wooden planks, and it creaked whenever we stepped on it. The water was murky and dark, and we never saw any fish in it. The pond, the cabin, the pier. They all gave us a creepy, unmistakable vibe. Even on the sunniest of days, it felt like something was wrong in that area. We ignored the feeling, though, and continued to go hunting there every once in a while. We enjoyed the thrill of tracking down deer, rabbits, or squirrels, and bringing them back to the cabin for dinner. We had a rifle, a shotgun, and a hunting knife, and we felt prepared for anything. That was until the day we saw it. It was a cold, cloudy day in late autumn. We'd been walking along the trail for a few hours, and we hadn't seen any signs of game. We decided to head back to the cabin and try again the next day. As we approached the pond, we heard a splash. We thought it might be a fish, or a frog, or maybe a beaver. We walked over to the pier and looked into the water. What we saw was not a fish, or a frog, or a beaver. It was a humanoid creature with pale, scaly skin, long, clawed limbs, and a mouth full of sharp teeth. It had yellow, glowing eyes and horns on its head. It looked like a wendigo, you know, from a Native American folklore. It was staring at us. We froze in shock and reached for our weapons. The creature lunged at us, and we fired. The bullets hit it, but it didn't seem to feel any pain. It dodged our shots and jumped out of the water. It landed on the pier and ran towards us. We backed away and tried to reload. The creature was faster, though, and it reached us before we could shoot again. It grabbed my dad by the arm and bit into his flesh. 
He screamed and dropped his rifle. I stabbed the creature with my knife and it let go of my dad. It turned to me and snarled. I swung my knife again, but it dodged. It kicked me in the chest and I fell to the ground. It was about to pounce on me when my dad picked up his rifle and tried to shot it in the head. The creature fell and ran. We got up and seeing it ran. We were scared, so we did the same. Left our weapons, our backpacks, and our prey behind. We didn't care. We just wanted to get away from that place. We ran all the way to my grandmother's house and locked the doors. We called the police and told them what happened. They didn't believe us, of course. They thought we were drunk or high or crazy. The bitter cold of the Alaskan wilderness gripped our team as we navigated through the dense snow-covered forest. I, Matt, led a Navy SEAL team on a critical mission to rescue hostages from an unknown base rumored to be controlled by a secret Russian police. The coordinates led us deeper into the harsh, unforgiving terrain, with each step increasing the tension in the crisp air. As we trudged through the snow, our breath visible in the freezing temperatures, a sudden growl echoed through the trees. We halted, our senses on high alert. Out of the shadows emerged a creature like none we had ever seen before. It resembled a snowy Bigfoot, its body sculpted like a pro bodybuilder, and its thick fur blending seamlessly with the Arctic landscape. The creature lunged at us with surprising speed, catching us off guard. Our training kicked in and the team fought back, a chaotic clash of gunfire and beastly roars echoing through the snowy expanse. We managed to repel the creature and it retreated into the woods, leaving us shaken but alive. Undeterred, we pressed on toward the coordinates, only to find an abandoned base. The once hidden facility now lay eerily silent with signs of a violent struggle evident. The hostages were gone, and among the casualties were scientists and what seemed to be Russian soldiers. We deduced that the creature we encountered earlier was responsible for the carnage, its deadly capabilities beyond our understanding. Determined to complete our mission, we set out to locate the creature and called for backup. As we ventured further into the wilderness, we stumbled upon a tribe of these snowy Bigfoot creatures. Fearful and uncertain of their intentions, we opened fire. The forest erupted into chaos as a fierce battle ensued between our team and the elusive tribe. After fifteen intense minutes, the sound of additional gunfire reached our ears. Backup forces had arrived just in time, forcing the tribe to retreat into the snowy depths of the wilderness. The cost of victory, however, was steep. Three of our seals lay lifeless on the frozen ground, and the snowy Bigfoot casualties numbered fifteen. Just when we thought the mission was over, a government helicopter descended from the sky. Men in black suits approached, their demeanor threatening. We were ordered to remain silent about the mysterious creatures we encountered, the government's secrecy overshadowing our dedication to duty. I'm here in Charleston, West Virginia, but back in 2011, December 15, I was traveling through Point Pleasant for work on United State Route 35. It was about 3, 3.30 in the morning, icy conditions. The roads were snow-covered, just your typical December early morning in West Virginia. I was going around this bend and this big figure appeared in the roadway. I mean, I couldn't see anything beyond it. It looked to be maybe eight to ten feet tall. It looked to have wings. I just stopped in the middle of the road. I couldn't go anywhere. I froze. Not only my vehicle was stopped, but I froze, and this figure, whatever it was, just stood there in the middle of the road, and I was there for, I don't know, a minute or two minutes. I mean, I don't know how long, but it seemed like forever, and it finally darted off into the woods. And I sat there for another few minutes trying to collect myself. I kept going around the bend and about a mile up the road. A tractor. Trailer hit jackknife. There were no other vehicles around. It looked like it just happened. 
Luckily, I was able to call emergency services and get them out on the scene. I just had this weird feeling about myself. Well, going back to 1967, December 15, there at the Silver Bridge, my great-grandfather actually went across the Silver Bridge like an hour or so before it collapsed in my great-grandma. I never had a chance to meet my great-grandfather, but my great. Grandmother said that, he said, after everything had happened. He had this weird feeling about himself going across that bridge, and as soon as he got to work, he worked at one of the factories out there at Point Pleasant, and he said that he just had this weird feeling about himself, and that's how I felt about what happened on December 15, 2011, so many years after the Silver Bridge collapse. I never really could tell what the creature was. I just know that it was a big, dark figure, probably about 50 feet in front of me. It was in my headlights, and it was snowing. It was just me in the vehicle, and like I said, it was like three in the morning, or something like that. I mean, it was just, I don't know if it was warning me not to go right then, like whenever that tractor trailer jackknifed. It was like it was just telling me, you need to stop, and I did. I know why so many people go missing from national parks. I don't know why I went to Mount Rainier. I mean, I know what I went to Mount Rainier for, but to this day I don't really know why I felt so compelled to go. I've always been obsessively curious. I think that's probably the best way to describe it. I get these fascinations for things out of seemingly nowhere, and once that fascination lodges itself in my head, it quickly starts to take over every waking aspect of my life, it seems. Thinking about it turns into reading about it. Reading about it turns into researching it as thoroughly as possible. Research leads to investigation, and the rabbit hole of my obsessions just goes and goes. And then, as suddenly as this obsession starts, it's gone complete and total disinterest, just like that. Ever since I was a kid, it's been this way. I kind of compare it to an itch, and ultimately the only way to really stop an itch is to scratch it, right? I remember laying on my couch on a rainy off day from work and scrolling through YouTube while I waited for the Domino's guy to drop off some buffalo wings when a strange title I'd never heard of came up and caught my eye. Missing 411, Strange and Unexplained Disappearances in America's National Parks. As soon as I clicked on that video, I knew I'd found my newest obsession. The Dietlov Pass incident I had been researching for months now was gone and out the window. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, as the saying goes. I had no idea that I was about to set an unchangeable course that led me to the horrifying reality I was soon to discover. Three weeks and probably a hundred videos, a handful of ordered books, and an endless scrolling through every forum and internet thread I could get my hands on, and I was still just as enamored with these missing four one ones as I'd been when I first clicked on that initial youd video. I'd be genuinely surprised if there were a lot of people reading this who didn't know about David Paul Adiz, the missing 411s, and all of confounding mysteriousness that surrounded these matters. But for those who might be out of the loop, I'll do my best to sum it up in a few little bullet points. For you, cliff notes or whatever. 1. There have been a disturbingly large number of unexplained disappearances in America's national parks. And by large number, I mean 2,000. That's more than everyone in the North Tower on 9-11. 2,000 people just vanishing in the woods with no explanation whatsoever. 2. A lot of these people are never seen or heard from again. That in its own right is insane given the technologies that we have and the massive searches that are sometimes carried out for these people. But what's even weirder is that the people that are eventually found leave us more questions than answers. Kids go missing and are found miles and miles away from the initial search zone, way further than even top survival experts are able to walk. 
people's bodies turn up in super obvious areas that have been searched multiple times by search and rescue teams. Search dogs will have a good obvious trail on the missing person and then just lose it. Sometimes all they find are the person's shoes. Sometimes they find the person with no shoes at all. Sometimes the bodies look like they've fallen from a great height, despite there being no high ground to fall off of, etc. 3. The number of times military units have been deployed to go and search for missing people is eyebrow-raising, to say the least. The military is very effective, but they're not search and rescue. They're trained to seek and destroy, not really search and save. 4. The National Park Service gets very, very sketchy when it comes to any kind of further inquiry. This has led a lot of people to believe that they're covering something up. Now, me being the obsessive person that I am immediately started trying to sleuth around for some kind of conclusion. What was the overall theory? What did people think was going on here? I guess because the speculation can go on forever. The theories go on forever, too. Everything from rich megalomaniacs on hunting trips, aliens, windigos, and skinwalkers, Bigfoot abductions, parallel universes. The list is truly endless. So many different theories, and as wild as some of them might sound at first. It's beyond eerie how quickly they begin to sound more than rational, and even possible with just a little bit of explanation. But as I poured through the seemingly endless accounts and rumors, there was one theory that hit a stronger chord with me than the rest. Feral people. In a nutshell, the theory is that during the Great Depression, maybe even earlier, People took off with their families deep into these wilderness regions to live off the land and get away from the crippling poverty of the cities and towns during that time. Generations of incest and isolation resulted in their ancestors being what we would consider feral completely hostile, incapable of reasoning that we can comprehend. With a multi-generational knowledge of the land they lived in and how to survive it, paired with a relatively untouched, Government protected after all, access to a virtually endless number of resources. Other humans, if the opportunity presented itself, could not only be a decent food opportunity, but they were also food opportunity with extremely valuable tools, just ripe for taking. Like cereal with a prize in the box. Can you imagine how valuable a water bottle would be to a caveman? How wildly priceless a fishing pole would look. The National Park Service knows about these furrow people, but they also know it'd be a huge risk to go traipsing in the wilderness, looking for bloodthirsty cannibals that are more competent and dangerous than even the most apex predators they live with. They also provide an extremely valuable insight for scientists to study all sorts of things about human nature, but from time to time they get a little too close. Or they get the bowl and give their locations away, the military gets called in to dispose of these tribes in a discreet and efficient manner before more people disappear, and as a result, more people take to the woods to find their missing people. For whatever reason, this theory made perfect sense to me. Well, almost perfect sense. It checked almost all the boxes. Children and elderly people go missing because they're the easiest to overpower. Hikers who are by themselves go missing because they're by themselves and can be ambushed quicker than a group of hikers could. Hunters go missing because they're far off the beaten path and they have weapons that are worth the risk. It even explains why bow hunters tend to go missing more than gun hunters. Bows are easier to figure out. In lower maintenance, we already know people go missing. Without a trace and are never found again. Would it be so wild to say in the same breath that people are never found in the first place for the same reasons? Even most of your Bigfoot sightings in these national parks could be explained with the feral people theory. Imagine what you would look like if you had never had a haircut, if you'd never taken a shower, or clipped your nails, or combed your hair, or shaved your beard, throw a Habsburg jaw, or a heavy brow in the mix from years of intrafamilial breeding, and you're pretty much the perfect definition of a Sasquatch at that point. 
But for all the information and cross-examinations that I would read about to seemingly prove this theory, there were admittedly a few glaring loopholes that, with a bit more thought, would very quickly start to pull the whole idea apart. Humans are truly a scourge on this planet. Anywhere we go, we leave a mess. We make smoke from fires. We burn things down accidentally. We cut down trees and leave bones lying all over the place. The very steps we take kill the forest floor, leaving huge patches of dirt wherever we stay for more than a few days. We are hands down the easiest animal to find. Every human that's ever walked the earth inherently believes that the earth is theirs. I guess it manifests even the most unconscious of ways. Not to mention the scientific probabilities, infertility that comes with incest, crippling genetic mutations, etc. For all the positive evidence, I'll be the first to admit there were some serious holes in the theory. So around and around I went with this concept for months, ruling it in and ruling it out until one day I was given what I can only describe as a divine revelation. Like the conspiracy gods took pity on my slow decay into insanity and threw me a nice big bone to chew on, and this one actually had some meat on it. I had fallen asleep on the couch amidst another bout of determined research. YouTube was once again in the background. When I woke up from my nap, I went for the remote, when the narrator of the video caught my attention. Missing 411 said rabbit hole into unexplained mysteries in general, and unexplained mysteries had rabbit hole into crazy discoveries made by scientists and historians. The narrator was talking about this skull that had been found. The picture of it was posted up for the viewer to see while he talked about it. It was an old, weathered-looking skull that had puncture holes in the cranium part. Because of these holes, scientists thought for a long time that this child had been the victim of a human sacrifice. But through a series of discoveries, it was made apparent that this child in actuality had been ticked clean off the ground by a crowned eagle. Suddenly it hit me. I sprang out of my seat like a madman as all the pieces began to fall together like an Rubik's Cube that was all but solving itself. Giant eagles! I know, I know. It sounds ridiculous. On the surface, more ridiculous than any other theory brought forward. But like my dad always said, the difference between batshit and guano is the stuff that's inside it, and this was no different. I'm not going to get into every painful detail here, but I do have to point out a few just to show you where I'm coming from here. 1. Eagles eat take. Out! They swoop in. Snatch and kill their food. Fly it back and eat in the nest. This explains why people go missing and are never found again. They're being looked for somewhere on the forest floor. When they've actually been carried up a mountain and dropped in a nest somewhere. This also explains why the people who are found are way further out than they by all rights should be, and why so many seem to have fallen from a great height. The eagle takes someone who's a little too heavy, takes someone who doesn't die right away and squirms a bit too much, gets spooked or startled and needs to fly faster, and they drop their meal. 2. Eagles are ambush predators. They hang out on a perch, and as soon as they see a tasty snack, they swoop in, pin it down, kill it, then swoop back with their newly acquired meal to wherever it is they nest at. This explains why so many lone hikers go missing off a trail. Just like a hunter would babysit a game trail for deer, an eagle babysits a footpath for humans. In speaking of deer, 3. An eagle large enough to swoop up with a human would more than likely have a reliable food source of deer, and there are a crap ton of deer. In Yellowstone alone, there are over 2,000 mule deer running around, and that's just mule deer. And this is the very reason why hunters go missing. If you're out hunting a deer, then chances are you're wearing scents and making deer calls. In other words, you are actively trying to convince deer that you are in fact also a deer, but the same artificial smells and bleats that would attract a nice big ten point would just as easily be a free food sign for a large bird of prey. 4. 
This also explains why so many times only aspects of the missing person have been found. Shoes, backpacks, cameras, hiking sticks, bows, etc. Eagles are smart creatures. They probably learn pretty quickly that there's a lot of stuff on these humans that aren't edible. Clothing can be torn through easily enough, but the thicker, more durable stuff gets ripped off and discarded, like a deer's antlers. The feet are torn off by the ankles, and smaller animals eat whatever is left inside. Now, I know if you're reading this, you're probably thinking one glaring thing. Come on, St. Circa. You'd think someone would notice giant eagles flying around. But they have. That's why the National Park Service gets so shady when people try to investigate further. They are well aware that there are giant eagles living in the hundreds of miles these national parks reach out to sometimes, and considering eagles only hunt in a roughly 15-20 mile perimeter around their nests, they know exactly where to find them as well. America's national bird is the bald eagle. It's been that way since 1782. By 1963, there were only 400 nesting pairs of bald eagles in the entire country. Why? Because people shot them out of the sky in droves. Not for their meat, not for their valuable talons or beaks. Researchers say that these eagles were killed mainly to see them up close. That's it. Do you think for half a second there wouldn't be a thousand hillbillies with birdshot scouring the entire countryside? The second it was discovered that there were giant eagles flying around? My best guess is that the National Park Service works in tandem with wildlife conservationist groups to keep these endangered animals as secret as possible. But you can't just let giant man eating eagles at each other willy-nilly and fly around eating whatever they feel like. No one's going to go spend money to hang out at a natural park they'll be killed and eaten at. That'd be horrible for business. In comes the military. You see... It's not just the military that sent out to find these missing people. It's one particularly small but highly effective section of the military, and that section is the Green Berets. Green Berets have a large set of skills, but two of their main purposes are special reconnaissance and unconventional warfare, and almost all their operations fall under the category of classified. In layman's terms, they specialize in finding things and reporting information on it, in killing things in very unique and creative ways. And then, of course, they're not allowed to talk about any of it. Total secrecy. You think these guys get called out because Tiny Tim got turned around in the woods? Bullshit. The government can't even send a real hazmat team to Palestine, Ohio, when a chemical fire radiates the entire town. No, they go out there when park rangers suspect Tiny Tim got turned into a giant eagle's lunch, and they need the best of it. Best to identify if that is indeed the case and take it down or dispose of it properly if it is, and keep their mouths shut about it afterwards. They get sent out when scientists speculate that the giant eagle population has grown too high and is risking compromise. The Green Berets go out and depopulate a bit keep the population under control, and keep their mouths shut about it afterwards. They get sent out when one dies so they can collect the body for research and keep their mouths shut about it afterward. I was absolutely sure of it, but even after this certainty cemented itself into everything else, I knew to be true. A new dangerous itch began to invade the back of my mind. You can't just know that a house is haunted. You have to actually see the ghost, don't you? I fought it for longer than I thought possible, but within seven months of watching that first video I found myself driving to Mount Rainier. I had to complete the experiment. I had to be sure that I was sure, that I was sure. How's that song go, the old ladies one? Blinded with science. Took forever to plan the trip. I'd already been spending weeks studying things about eagles, but now I had to reorient and study how to spot eagles when they hunted, how to watch them without spooking them, etc. But after four deep diving months, I had my plan and everything I needed to carry it out. I chose Mount Rainier for two reasons, the first being it was close, 
The second being that there have been an unusual number of disappearances, not only on the mountain itself, but in the entirety of the national park that surrounded it, even by national park standards. In the small hours of the morning, as the sun was just beginning to rise, I took off down the trail and began looking for the perfect spot to set up my blind. See, normal eagles hang out in big trees or on the sides of cliffs, but my hypothesis was that a giant eagle would probably be hanging out in crevices against cliffs. When something it could eat walked into its radar, it would swoop out and ambush it. About four hours into my trip, I found a spot I thought was ideal. A small hilltop with trees, but not too many trees. At the bottom of the hill to my left, a large cliff wall could be seen. To the right was relatively flat land with enough space in between for a large bird to fly through unhindered. And so I waited and waited and waited. For three days I sat in that blind, watching the deer eating cold misses and trying my hardest not to doze off. At the beginning of day four, however, it would all change. I was just considering leaving. When you're alone in a ramshackle tent, it doesn't take long for your mind to convince you of what an idiot you are. Giant eagles, come on, St. Circa, look at all the time you've wasted. Why can't you get hooked on something productive? As a big ten point stepped out of the brush into the area just in front of me, I watched it with a sort of board down. Deer are cool the first time you see one, but this had to have been the 100th deer in three days that I'd seen. And at the end of the day, they're just horses with antlers. They mosey. They eat. They poop and leave. I guess in my boredom, I didn't really notice how quiet the forest had gotten. The deer did, though. It stopped mid-bite and perked its head up, locked rigidly into place with a big mess of grass hanging out of its mouth. And that's when it happened. It was so fast, my mind hardly had time to process it. One moment the deer was standing there, and the next it was pinned to the ground. I sat there wide-eyed and in shock from the hidden barrier of my blind. Standing over this thing was the largest animal I'd ever seen. Its huge wingspan seemed to stretch endlessly. It had to have been forty feet from end to end. The forest floor was shaded almost completely as its outstretched wings blotted the sun from the sky. Even without the wings, it was almost too large to comprehend, at least eight feet off the ground on its two taloned legs, its dinosaur-like eyes gazing emptily into its prey like huge orbs of golden fire. The poor animal let out one bleated scream before the eagle's large beak tore into its neck, sending streams of blood and tissue across the forest floor like something out of a slasher movie. I could hear bones crunching violently even from the distance I was at. Suddenly I realized I had to take a photo. No one would believe it if I didn't show them firsthand. Even then they'd have probably thought it was just a hoax. Green screens and giant Photoshop, all that shit. I raised the lens of my camera towards the creature with shaking hands and snapped a shot. Huge, huge mistake. As soon as the camera made that stupid little fluttering sound, the eagle's head snapped instantly in my direction, its lifeless eyes staring with pure instinct straight through the camouflage of my structure. It saw me. Before I could react, there was a sharp blast of wind. In less than a moment, the entire blind was ripped off of its stakes and thrown into the woods around me. As I recovered and looked around, panic-stricken, I could see the horrible thing tearing into the remnants of the plastic structure some fifteen or twenty feet in front of me, trying to find me inside of it. With everything I could muster, I took off in the direction of my car. I've never ran so fast in my life. It took a long time to get back to my car, and the few times I stopped to try and catch my breath or dry. Heave, I was all but sure, would result in me being another missing four, one one on Mount Rainier. After what felt like days of almost endless running, I made it back to my car, exhausted and frightened for my life. As I sat in the driver's seat, hyperventilating from exhaustion and weeping from fear, I couldn't wrap my mind around what I'd just witnessed or how I was still here to think about it. The only thing I could think about was getting the hell as far away from Mount Rainier as possible. 
As I made the long drive home, and my thoughts began to somewhat return to me, I concluded that the eagle must have gotten itself trapped in the blind just long enough for me to get away. It was either that or the deer it had killed had way more meat than I did, and it was already dead. I guess it'd be pointless to chase a smaller prey. Eagles are wicked smart, after all. I tried to contact several authorities afterwards, but surprise, surprise, no one believed it. You know, sir, eagles are a lot bigger than people initially think they are. Are you sure you weren't using any illegal substances? Okay, well, we'll send someone out to look at it and tell you what we find. Huh? Huh? We'll let you know if we find anything. We'll let you know. That camera is still out there in the woods with the rest of my stuff. I don't know if I'll ever be brave enough to try and go back for it. Maybe someone will find it and the truth will be that much harder to dismiss. For now, I only have you guys to tell. The National Park Service is hiding something big in the mountains and forests of the United States. And if you ever go hiking in one of these remote places, make sure you are never alone. I grew up in very rural Arkansas, once stayed in a tent in the backyard with a friend when we were about 12 camping. I had a dog named Shadow that stayed outside and she was the bestest girl. My backyard butted up against hundreds of acres of wood, so coyotes and bobcats were pretty common, but never came onto the property because of Shadow. That night as we stayed in the tent, reading scary stories and talking girl talk, we heard what sounded like a woman screaming, not that far away. I froze because my dad had told me that mountain lion sounded exactly like that, and I wasn't sure we'd even make it back to my back door if we made a run for it. My friend was terrified and thought a woman needed help, and I was trying to, to her, that we had no neighbors for miles, in what I thought it probably was when Shadow started growling just outside the tent. I have probably never been so terrified before or since. She started barking and moving away from the tent in one direction. And that's when my dad threw open the back door and did one of those high-pitched dad whistles and ran towards the tent yelling us to get out, gun in hand. We ended up sleeping inside that night. A few weeks later, when we were headed down to the gravel mine for target practice, a massive pit in the ground about a mile away from our home and we saw a mountain lion on the other side, and Dad murmured to me that it must be my friend. It was massive and terrifying and beautiful, and I haven't ever seen another in person. I was driving home during the early evening from Williamsburg, Virginia, on a 64 West towards Richmond. About a mile past the RT-607 overpass, I saw something ahead of me on the right. The best I can describe it is that it looked like a huge black dog standing on its back legs off the shoulder at the edge of the woods. I slowed up because the person in front of me was looking at it as well. There is no doubt that it was there. As I drove by it, the beast just disappeared. It was so quick though I suppose it could have stepped back into the woods. I was in shock, I believe. I flashed my headlights in order to draw attention to the driver. I believe it was a woman. To possibly pull over so I could ask her what she saw. She sped up and continued on her way. I for a fact that others on the highway had seen it. It looked to be at least seven feet tall with a huge head, like that of a German shepherd. All the hair was black. The body was tapered at the torso, like what you see in the werewolf movies. I don't believe in werewolves. By the way, I didn't really notice much below the waist, since much of it was hidden by tall weeds. My girlfriend, her father and I, were parked on the bank of the Chattahoochee River. My girlfriend's father was sitting on the hood of the car with his fishing pole in front of him. He was night catfishing. While we sat there with the car lights shining across the river, my girlfriend and I were sitting in the front seat, just making small talk. 
honest, when all of a sudden I heard the most horribly incredible scream coming from my right side. To set the scene, our car was parked about two feet from the water on the bank. Off to my right, about sixty feet was where the foliage began. Very swampy, very thick, and very hard to walk through. About forty feet further up the bank, which can't be seen from our car because of the foliage, is a huge oak tree. I'd have to guess that the tree had about a fifteen-foot circumference. Massive. About ten feet up the tree is a huge branch that went about twenty feet out over the river. My friends and I would climb the tree and jump or dive into the river, at least once every couple of weeks or so. During one occasion, there were about nine of us standing on this branch attempting to make it move. We barely made it do anything, let alone shake. Anyway, back to the car. As I heard the scream, my body instantly went into what I think was shock. As I turned to my right slowly, with all my hair standing straight up, we heard the next sound. Pechu chu my feeble attempt to describe the sound of that huge branch I mentioned earlier that was shaking due to something gigantic jumping off it into the water. The splash that came next was equally as horrific. All we did was just sit there in shock, waiting, I don't know why, staring at this point, straight ahead at the water. My guess is that we were waiting for the thing to float into our headlights. We waited and waited, and did, and all of a sudden an object, black long, I would guess at least nine, ten feet, floated into our headlights and stopped. Please keep in mind that this action was deliberate, because it was floating downstream. We stared at it, forever it seemed, until it opened its eyes, two huge balls of red, reflecting off the headlights of our car, I imagine, light and looked at us. My girlfriend's father, at this point, put the car into reverse, and we sped off. Extremely terrified. 1982. My second encounter, April, my girlfriend and I were driving back from our senior prom, Georgia, Chattahoochee River border area. Our high school was 37 miles down River Way, out in the boondocks. Anyway, as we were driving back home, we came to a flat two-mile section of road that had a slippery when wet sign. Because we were tired, sober, with road hypnosis, the sign reflection caught our attention, she told me after. As we came closer to the sign, something moved or reflected as we came closer, getting our attention. About 100 feet away, with our car lights fully shining on the it, we saw this massive black creature leaning on the sign. The top of the sign, I guess, to be about 10 feet. Whatever this creature was, all we could see was the top of the chest and down, about ten feet of the creature. We couldn't see the head, it just stood there. We could see the massive muscles, most in rippling detail shiny black fur, standing with intelligence if you can understand that term, etc. We sped up all the while screaming at each other, scared to death. A mile down the road, my left rear tire blew out. I drove seven miles to the first house with a light and called my father to come out and help us. While at this home, we talked with a few of the people that were there. They were having a party. We were told a couple of stories about a missing hunter, animals found gutted or with their head missing, a lot of strange screams in the night, etc. First, I must say beyond a shadow of any doubt that this was no hoax. The costume alone would have cost thousands and thousands of dollars to create. Second, the people that live in the area are extremely poor. As a matter of fact, the home that we drove up to after our tire blew had light seeping through the cracks in the siding of the house while it sat on cinder blocks. Very poor people. I'd been a park ranger for over a decade, and I had seen my fair share of strange occurrences in the woods, but nothing could have prepared me for what I encountered on that fateful day. I was patrolling the deep woods, as I often did, when I came across a family of hikers. They were clearly distressed, and I could see the fear in their eyes. They told me that they had been attacked by a creature with glowing eyes and razor-sharp claws. At first, I was skeptical. But as I looked at their injuries, I realized that something truly terrible had happened to them. 
I knew that I had to find this creature, whatever it was, and put an end to its reign of terror. I followed the hiker's trail, and soon enough I heard rustling in the bushes. I reached for my flashlight and pointed it in the direction of the sound. That's when I saw it. The creature was unlike anything I had ever seen before. It stood on two legs, with glowing eyes that seemed to pierce my soul. Its claws were razor sharp, and its teeth were like needles. It let out a bone-chilling growl and charged towards me. I had never been so terrified in my life. I tried to back away, but the creature was too fast. It tackled me, and I felt its sharp claws tear through my flesh. I struggled to break free, but it was too strong. Finally, the creature released me and ran off into the woods. I was shaken, but I knew that I couldn't let it get away. I got up and ran after it, determined to catch it. But the woods were dark and twisted, and I soon lost sight of the creature. I searched for hours, but it was nowhere to be found. Eventually, I had to give up and make my way back to the ranger station. As I sat there nursing my wounds, I realized that I had never encountered anything like this before. It was a creature unlike anything in our known world, and it was out there, somewhere, waiting for its next victim. As a park ranger, I've always loved exploring the wilderness and... I've seen some strange things over the years, but nothing could have prepared me for what I found deep in the heart of the park. It was a hot summer day, and I was on patrol, making my way through a dense thicket of trees when I stumbled upon a small town. It was unlike anything I had ever seen before, and at first I thought I had stumbled upon some sort of movie set. The buildings were small and rustic, made of weathered wood and surrounded by gardens filled with herbs and vegetables. The people who lived there were Native Americans, and they all seemed to be busy with their daily tasks. They stopped and looked at me as if they were surprised to see me there. As I approached, I was greeted by a man who introduced himself as the leader of the community. He explained that they had been living there for generations in harmony with nature and each other. They had no interest in the outside world and preferred to keep to themselves. I was fascinated by their way of life and I spent the next few hours talking to the locals and learning about their customs and traditions. But as the sun began to set, they started to warn me about something I had never heard of before. The Wendigo. They told me that the Wendigo was a dangerous creature that roamed the deep woods, preying on anyone who was foolish enough to venture into its territory. They warned me to stay away from the woods at night and to always be on the lookout for any signs of the creature. I didn't believe them, of course. I had seen my fair share of dangerous animals in the park, but I had never heard of anything like the Wendigo. I thanked them for their hospitality and went on my way, convinced that they were just trying to scare me. As I made my way back to the ranger station, the sun had already set and the woods were shrouded in darkness. I heard strange noises coming from the trees, and I could feel a sense of unease creeping up on me. It was as if the forest itself was alive and watching me. And then, out of nowhere, I saw it, a creature that was unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was tall and emaciated, with long, bony limbs and piercing red eyes. It stood there, watching me, before disappearing into the woods. I was terrified. I had never felt so alone and vulnerable in my life. I tried to run, but I quickly realized that I was hopelessly lost. The woods seemed to stretch out in all directions, and I had no idea which way to go. As the night wore on, the creature continued to haunt me, appearing and disappearing as if toying with me. I was cold, hungry, and scared out of my mind. And then, just as suddenly as it had started, it was over. The sun began to rise, and the creature was gone. When I finally made it back to the ranger station, I was a mess. I had never been so scared in my life, and I knew that I had come dangerously close to becoming the Wendigo's next victim. I tried to tell my colleagues what had happened, but they didn't believe me. They thought I was just tired and imagining things. But I knew what I had seen and I knew that I would never forget the terror that I had experienced in those woods. From that day on, I made sure to listen to the warnings of the locals and to always be on the lookout for any signs of danger. 
because in the deep woods of the park, you never know what might be lurking just beyond the trees. Yellowstone National Park is a breathtaking wonderland of geysers, hot springs, and majestic wildlife. As a park ranger named Jenna, I've spent countless hours patrolling its sprawling landscapes and marveling at its natural beauty. One night, while on my regular patrol, I saw something that left me shaken to my core. I caught sight of a creature unlike any other, with fur as black as the night and eyes that glowed like embers. It was a werewolf. The werewolf was massive, towering over me on two legs with sharp claws that glittered in the moonlight. I froze in terror as it locked eyes with me, a low growl rumbling deep in its chest. Despite my fear, I knew that I had to follow the creature to try and figure out what it was doing in the park. I trailed it through the wilderness, careful to keep my distance as it moved deeper into the forest. But as I tried to get closer, I stumbled and lost my footing, causing the werewolf to hear me and sprint away. I tried to follow, but soon lost sight of it in the darkness. When I reported the sighting to my supervisor, he dismissed it as a figment of my imagination. I was devastated that no one believed me despite knowing what I had seen. For weeks after the encounter, I felt like I was being watched, like the werewolf was still out there, lurking in the shadows. And even though I knew that it was unlikely, I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone in the wilderness. As the weeks went on, I found myself becoming more and more paranoid. Every rustle in the bushes, every howl in the distance sent shivers down my spine. I couldn't shake the feeling that the werewolf was still out there, waiting for its chance to strike. One night, while on patrol, I heard a faint howling in the distance. It was the same howling I had heard on the night of my encounter. I knew that I had to investigate. I followed the howling to a remote section of the park where I found a pack of wolves but among them I caught sight of the werewolf once again. This time I was prepared. I had brought a camera with me to document the creature's existence, and I was able to capture a clear image of it. As I turned to leave, I fell and the camera broke. Wolves heard me, and they started running in my direction. I stand up and run to my truck. Once left, I just sighed and told myself that I'm not paid enough to witness this crap. As a park ranger at Mount Rainier National Park, I have spent countless hours exploring the vast expanse of forests, meadows, and glaciers that make up this majestic landscape. Towering over everything is the imposing Mount Rainier, its snow-capped peak visible for miles around. It is a place of great natural beauty, but also of danger and mystery. One night I received a call on my radio from a lost camper. He was disoriented and couldn't find his way back to his campsite. I set out to help him, my flashlight guiding me through the darkness. But as I got closer to his location, I began to feel a sense of unease. The woods were unnaturally quiet, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me. When I finally found the camper, he was sitting in a small clearing, his eyes fixed on something in the distance. I asked him what was wrong, but he didn't answer. I followed his gaze and saw a figure in the darkness, just beyond the tree line. It was tall and thin, with unnaturally long limbs and a distorted face. It moved with an unnatural grace, and I knew that this was no ordinary creature. I grabbed the camper and tried to run, but the creature was faster. It pursued us through the woods, its elongated fingers reaching out to grab us. We stumbled and fell, but somehow managed to stay one step ahead of it. Finally, we reached the safety of my ranger station, but the memory of that night still haunts me. I know that something sinister lurks in the woods of Mount Rainier National Park, and I fear that one day it will come for me again. In the spring of 2009, I was driving through central Wisconsin from Minneapolis to my home in northern Michigan on Highway 64. Between Gilman and Medford, I had been seeing deer on the road since St. Croix. So I was driving slowly and on high alert. 
at the farthest reach of my eye beams, I saw something walking across the road. I slowed way down to about 30 miles per hour, and that's when I saw it. Now, here's the weird part. I saw the back of it as it was jumping over the steel barrier. It was bipedal, had legs that resembled a moose and ears like a dog, but no tail. It had to have been seven, eight feet tall. I think I almost swallowed my tongue. I came to a T in the road about a half hour later. Right at the T, there is a bar. It was open, and I needed a drink. Just a shot. I was driving after all. I must have had a wild look on my face because I just sat down at the end of the bar and asked for a shot of anything. When the bartender poured me a shot of J.D., he said, You just saw it, didn't you? I didn't say a word. I just looked at him. He said, This one is on the house. I drank the damn shot, put five dollars on the bar, and left. I never mentioned it to anyone else until now. So let me start my story by giving you a little background. I grew up and live in West Texas. There's not much in the way of forests here unless you count the massive groves of mesquite trees that are very easy to get lost. And yes, I have, more than once. With that said, my story has nothing to do with even being near the woods or even outside of town. I grew up in a small town of less than 2,000 people. Rural, but still well-defined city limits, and the streets are pretty well lit at night, so neighborhood kids, my brother, and myself would often play until well past sundown. I should mention that my favorite game to play was Monster, which was basically freeze tag, except you got to pretend you were a monster. I always chose Goatman. I know. You're thinking that I'm going to see the Goatman whilst playing Monster and blah, blah. Yeah. No. I only knew about the Goatman because my parents had some friends who lived out in Bumble of nowhere in the country, and it was a pretty big deal to everyone who lived out there. It was mostly just the two spooky tales of drunk rednecks trying to scare my brother and myself, and we laughed at more than anything. Anyways, that's mostly a coincidence. As I stated before, Everything I'm about to write about happened well within the city limits on a Sunday night in July. There was this guy named Kelly who lived in a really crappy single wide trailer. Think like the FEMA trailers. But this was in the early 90s and was known for basically being the creepiest person in our neighborhood. He was tall with curly brown hair that stuck close to his head and he wore thick buddy holly looking glasses. Now there were numerous legends in our neighborhood about haunted houses in a hobo with a butcher knife, etc. But you could have written a book of short stories about the creepy stuff people had allegedly seen this guy do. People said that he dug around in the dumpsters at night, and that people had seen him digging up worms in their alley, examining them, and then proceeding to eat them or put them in his pockets for later. A friend of mine's mom even said that one evening, as it got dark, she saw him walk out into the road where someone had run over a kitten and then put it down the front of his pants and walk back into his house. The fact that the adults were in on this legend made it the most realistic and scare of them all. Apparently, he once had an older brother named Bo, who was mentally handicapped and lived with Kelly, but I never saw him because everyone said that he just disappeared. He had an old green bike under the carport that supposedly never moved again. Now, even at the age of five, I would like to think I was a bit rational, but I still spread rumors just like everyone else. I practically preached the one about the hobo with a butcher knife. However, I never talked about Kelly because I was legitimately scared of him. The reason why is that one night, when another boy and myself were playing alone, my brother was a bit older and was allowed to sleep over elsewhere and had the back gate of our yard open and were transitioning back and forth between the backyard and the alley. At one point, my friend Alex made a grunting noise. He asked me why I'd made that noise, seeing as it had nothing to do with playing our game, and I sort of shrugged it off, thinking that he was just messing with me. Besides, I was eager to get back to playing, and it was pretty dim. We had only been playing for maybe 30 minutes or so, this way before we heard something make a loud metallic thud in the dumpster. 
We had just walked back into the backyard, and so we quickly ran to the gate and peeked out into the alley, limping across the overgrown lot behind our house. We could see a figure moving. I immediately got what I now know is the uncanny valley feeling, even my five-year-old brain having trouble registering the jerky, claymation-like movements. Alex, on the other hand, thought he was hardcore or something because he shouted, Hey! in a very short, commanding tone. Hey! he yelled again. The figure spun around almost off balance and began walking back in the exact same jerking motion. Alex had a flashlight around his neck that his mom made him wear at night and he twisted the lid to shine it at the figure. I still remember it fairly clear. It was definitely Kelly. He stopped when the light came on and he was about 20 feet from us or so. His hands looked distorted and small, like normal at the biceps, but they began tapering and getting smaller after the elbow. They were drawn up close to his chest, almost like the way a chicken's wings hug their body. He was wearing flannel shirt that looked several sizes too small, and the sleeves were rolled up just past his elbow. The shirt was unbuttoned, and you could clearly see multiple teats. His face looked the way it would if it was mashed up against a window, particularly his nose, which was without a doubt a pig snout with two large nostrils. We just stood there, frozen with our mouths open for what felt like ten minutes. It couldn't have been more than one. <sighs> yeah, Kelly half, Kelly half, whooped, half squealed. Alex and I took off, leaving the back gate open. I ran in my house, and he didn't stop, so I assume he kept running until he got to his. Needless to say, my parents thought I was being hyped up and panicking because we were playing in the dark alone. But guys, I swear to you, I swear to God that as I sat on the toilet that night before bed, the, the bathroom window faced the backyard. I heard sniffing at the window, loud sniffing and almost a HRM sound hidden behind the curtain. For the rest of our time in that house, one more year, I had anxiety every time I was in that bathroom at night. Kelly stayed more reclusive than usual after that, and nobody in our circle of friends believed us. The only other time I saw him again was one day when he was working on his roof. His trailer was two lots away or so, and I was in the alley taking out the cat litter box with my brother. He was standing on his roof, looking down at it as if thinking about what he should do when he visibly sniffed the air and glanced in our direction before hurrying down his ladder and going back inside. So I asked then, What is was he? He wasn't Native American as far as I know, pale with curly hair. But after learning about skinwalkers, what with the strained speech patterns and the fact that he was doing God knows what in our dumpster and waiting for us to go away so he could run and hide. What the hell was he? I may write some more about our neighborhood in that area since there were some really strange people. A close friend of mine, who I trust is telling the truth, recently shared a story with me. I'm a huge skeptic of anything supernatural, but I can't come up with a logical explanation for this one, and I'm wondering what you all make of it. A long while back, he was in a car crash. He was not inebriated at the time, and he was the only person in the car. After the crash, he was able to unbuckle the seatbelt and get himself out of the car. He immediately went to medical services to get checked out. They got ready to do an x-ray, and when he removed his shirt, he had two bruises in the clear shape of hands. One was on his left shoulder, the other on his right hip. The way they were positioned, it's as if someone grabbed him hard from behind and pulled him into the seat. The marks were so visible that the doctor examining him immediately asked if there was someone else in the car with him, because he was convinced they were made by someone grabbing him from behind. At the time, my friend was very religious and explained it as a religious miracle, saving him in that crash. Since then, he's been disillusioned from the church, but still cites this as one of his primary pieces of evidence that something supernatural could be out there. But he has an open mind. I got his permission to post this, and he's curious what you have to offer as a possible explanation. Any ideas?
I never believed in ghosts or monsters until that night, the night we stumbled upon the abandoned ranger station deep in the woods. We were just a group of friends, looking for a weekend getaway in nature, but we never expected to find what we did. The ranger station was old, decrepit, and looked like it hadn't been used in years. But we were desperate for shelter, and we decided to spend the night there. As the sun went down, we started to feel uneasy. The station was eerily quiet, with only the sound of the wind rustling through the trees. And then we heard it, a low growling sound that seemed to come from all around us. At first, we thought it might be a bear or some other wild animal. But as the night wore on, we realized that something was hunting us, picking us off one by one. It started with one of us disappearing, and then another. We searched the station from top to bottom, but we found nothing. And then we saw it, a shadowy figure lurking in the darkness, its eyes glowing with an otherworldly light. We tried to leave, but something was blocking our path. We were trapped, with nowhere to run and no one to call for help. And as the night went on, we learned the horrifying truth. The ranger station was abandoned for a reason, and that reason was still there. We found old newspaper clippings that told the story of the ranger who used to live there. He was known for his love of nature and his dedication to protecting the forest. But something had changed him. Something had driven him to madness. And in the end, he had disappeared without a trace. As we read the articles, we started to hear footsteps coming from the hallway. And then we saw him, the ranger, or what was left of him. He was covered in matted fur, his eyes glowing with a sinister light. We tried to fight him off, but he was too strong. He had become something beyond human, something that couldn't be killed by conventional means. And as we fought for our lives, we realized that we had made a terrible mistake. We had come to the ranger station looking for adventure, but we had found something much darker, something that had been waiting for us, something that had been hungry for years. In the end, only a few of us made it out alive. We stumbled through the woods, battered and bruised, our hearts racing with fear. And as we looked back at the ranger station, we knew that we could never go back. The station was cursed, haunted by a horror beyond comprehension. And we were lucky to have survived, but we knew that we would never forget the night we stumbled upon the abandoned ranger station deep in the woods. I was born in 1968. I am the son of a miner, father and a miner. I am the father of two children. The incident happened to me in the mine where I worked a year or two before I retired. Everything started after an accident in the mine. That day, I went to the workplace as usual. In the morning, after having breakfast in the canteen of the workplace, I got into the cage to go 260 meters underground. When I say cage, I mean an elevator. We mine workers preferred to call it a cage instead of an elevator because it was a simple device that worked with a large crane rather than an elevator. Anyway, I went down to the mine. After working until the end of the shift, I started walking towards the bottom of the shaft. We call the place where we got into the cage the bottom of the shaft. As I was walking slowly, an engine passed by me quickly. What I call an engine can be considered as a small train. It was a relatively simple device compared to the train, pulling only wagons weighing up to one ton at most. There were workers in the engine. Normally, they are forbidden to do this. But sometimes when the workers are very tired after work, they ride on the engine to avoid walking. I continued to walk slowly as the engine sped past me. Then there was shouting coming from up ahead. Someone seemed to be moaning in a wheezing voice. I moved towards the direction of the sound in order to understand exactly what was happening. I started to look around carefully. When I approached the place where the sound came from, I saw that someone was lying in the water channel on the side of the air door. Blood was flowing from the person lying in the water channel as if from a fosse. At that moment, I went into a short-term shock. In that chaos, we immediately carried the injured person to the lift entrance, which we called the bottom of the shaft, and sent him to the hospital. I still could not get over the shock of that image. 
That day, that person who was injured in that accident died. This incident affected me deeply. My psychology turned upside down. According to what I learned later, the accident happened as follows. While the workers were traveling with the engine, the air door did not open. Since the engine was also fast, the engine hit the door with great violence. The worker who was caught between the engine and the door was crushed badly during this impact. In the days following this incident, when I passed through that gate, it always seemed to me as if someone was still lying in the water channel. I couldn't pass through there by myself. Since the hearth was not sufficiently lit, it was always very dark inside the hearth. It was only illuminated by fluorescent lamps, which were very sparsely placed in certain parts of the hearth. Because of the effect of this incident, I was completely disenchanted with work. I didn't feel like going to work at all, but I had to. Anyway, one day when I was at work again, I was the last one left at the end of work in the area of the mine where I was working. When I looked around, everyone had left. I sat down somewhere. Such a weight fell on me that it seemed like a lifetime to go from there to the lift area, which the workers called the bottom of the shaft. I said to myself, I'll rest a little where I'm sitting, and then I'll go. My eyes closed for a while. I was between sleep and wakefulness. I saw a man approaching me from ahead, holding a lamp in his hand. There is no work left at the stove at this hour. I guess he stayed later like me, I said to myself. That light that was approaching me suddenly disappeared. Oh my God, where did this man go? I said to myself. Then I thought, let me sit for one or two more minutes. Maybe the man who just disappeared will come back and we can go to the lift together. Then my eyes closed again. I don't know how much time passed. Suddenly I woke up with a very severe slap. But what a slap. I thought my neck was broken. I immediately recovered and looked around me. There was no one. It was impossible for someone to hit me and run away. For this reason, I started running towards the lift in fear and panic. That day, I didn't tell anyone about what had happened. One or two weeks later, I was the last one again. This time, I hurried up and went straight to the lift entrance. As I sat down and waited for the lift to arrive, I noticed that something jet black was coming towards me. It had a hand lamp and a hard hat, but neither of them was lit. It was slowly approaching me. I called out from afar, Master. What's wrong? Did the lamp malfunction? He didn't answer. Instead, it kept coming towards me slowly. I felt a strong sense of fear that I didn't know why. I wanted to get up and leave. I even wanted to run away, but I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. Although he was very close to me, I couldn't see his face or body clearly. It was as if the man coming towards me was not a tangible substance, but a shadow, a silhouette. Don't ever sleep on the hearth again, he said to me. I could feel the man's speech not in my ears, but in my brain. He spoke to me almost telepathically and disappeared. I had heard of such events from a few other people before, but I didn't believe it. At that moment, those stories I had heard went through my mind. I read all the prayers I knew. That black silhouette had not harmed me, but living that moment had further disrupted my already broken psychology. I couldn't get up from where I was sitting for another one. Two minutes. After a while, I pulled myself together and walked away from there. When I told my friends what had happened to me, they did not believe me. When I told what happened to me to the imam of the village where I lived, the imam believed me and said the following, They are the owners of the mines. As you know, according to Islamic belief, the souls of martyrs can choose to stay in this world instead of going to the hereafter if they wish. According to a saying of the Islamic prophet Muhammad, those who die into the rubble are considered martyrs just like those who die in war. That's why we call people who died in the mines mine martyrs. Most probably that thing you saw in the mine was the spirit of a mine martyr, and it warned you. He wanted to protect you. After that day, I never slept in the mine again. About the story. Hello. I am a journalist living in Turkey. Investigating the paranormal is my special interest. The story you have just read is a true story that was shared with me by one of my readers on condition of anonymity. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.